flat, no, I'm not wearing the hat today because it would be bad form. Like one World Series win after 108 years is monumental. I'm not gonna be that dick like a, like a Cardinals fan or some, oh, 11 rings, 15 rings, whatever. It's like, if you didn't win last year, shut up. You're not the best in baseball. Hi, welcome back to Kevin Pollock's chat show. I'm not Kevin Pollock. Nope, fooled you on April 2nd. I'm Sam Levine. You're stuck with me. Uh, but it's not so bad, because like I just mentioned in my little jokey joke, it's opening day! <laughs> opening day! The <laughs> long winter is over, and baseball is upon us again. A grateful nation rejoices. You sounded like George Costanzo, and he's like, I got a job with the New York Yankees! <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly, that is exactly what George I sounded Costanza. like. George uh, Costanza. Hello, Jamal, how are Hi, you? Hi, very well. Excellent. You look yeah. very well. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I think uh, maybe thanks to Jaden who did my makeup. Yes, Jaden has like, been has been uh, covering our, our makeup the last couple weeks, and I gotta say, that she's kid, got she's got the stuff. That kid's she, got the stuff. She knows what she's doing. Good. She's a she's she's a quick learner. She is. Yeah. She's a bright kid. She's a, she's a bright kid. I think we'll keep her. I think we'll keep her. Um, how uh, how are you planning on celebrating opening day? Uh, <laughs> well, I'm here. Okay. I'm so, I'm a hockey person. Like, I know I'm from you Pittsburgh, are. so I, I love my Penguins. I and that, yeah, so, um, but yeah, I'm not. That's okay. Well, hey, I wasn't not, big on the athletics. I understand. Clearly, I was uh, too busy the, being the, a nerd. The Cubs uh, are playing their uh, opening uh, uh, day game uh, later today against the uh, their arch rivals, the St. Louis Cardinals. Right. But game. they're not doing like their whole ceremony. No, until that will happen on at Monday, the, the a, first, month, a week from Monday. Yeah, the first home ah, game. I see. At I knew something. You did know that? I have. I'm, I'm a lot of my friends are Cubs fans. This is this not guy. knowledge I, yes, this, this is right knowledge here. I gained from them. Okay, impressive. Did you have any fun April Fool's pranks that you would like to share? Well, I, t um, see, well, first off, Kevin put a piece of duct tape over my eyes as I was sleeping, so when I woke up, I thought I was blind. So to retaliate, yep. I took a can of Duff beer and put it in a paint mixer. Yes. And then put it in the fridge, and then I turned up the heat really high when yep. Kevin was sweating up. Wait a minute, this was on The Simpsons. Hang on, so it's come to this. But another clip show. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank you. I look forward to your shenanigans being animated for forevermore. Um, there's just one last thing I have to say. Uh, I, I, it was it was teased at uh, I think slightly erroneously, but this is in fact I'm told by our producer Jason McIntyre. So I'm putting this all on him that this is in fact the 300th episode of the Kevin Pollock Chat Show. That's that's something else. Let me tell you, I the that any of us are still alive really for 300 episodes when we first began this thing. I'm, I'm surprised, and I can think of no better guest to celebrate with us at our 300th episode because, uh, well, I'll tell you why in a minute. I wrote our, our guest a lovely little intro, and I will make him wait no longer to hear it. Hmm. <clears throat> My guest today is an old friend of mine, but in many ways he feels like an old friend to all of us since we watched him grow up on screen. Nice. Starting at an uncomfortably young age, he's been no stranger to movies, television, and stage roles his entire life. You may know him best as Francis from Malcolm in the Middle, Buddy from Scary Movie 2, or Lewis from that episode of Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. But to me, <laughs> he'll always be the only man I ever shaved my ass for. Please welcome Chris Masterson. Wow. Thank you. What a nice yeah. intro. From the heart, buddy. By the way, this is the longest 90 seconds of my entire life sitting here, yep. not being able to talk, not yep. being included in the show. Yeah. And this is, you've done 300 episodes, so maybe people, let me know if guests already talk about yeah. this, but usually on a talk show, like, yeah. this happens, yeah. and then they introduce you, and then you walk out. But yeah. I'm right here. You are right there. But I can't talk, and I can't interact. You could have spoken, but you would not have been seen. Ah, okay. That's what I was trying to tell right, you, not on back. camera. I take it back. It's yeah. still great to be here. Yeah, I'm so happy to have you here. I can't tell you from the bottom of my heart. 300. This is 300. It's incredible. Yeah. And, uh, and there's no war with uh, Sparta or the, the, the Persian army? I was thinking of 300 references myself. Yeah. Do you know I still haven't seen that movie? No. Is it worth it? That movie is incredible. Okay. No joke. Okay. 300. If they counted the amount of abs in that movie, it'd be 3 million. 3 million abs. 
Math jokes? No? <laughs> 300 is an awesome movie. Yeah. Gerard Butler. Cut. You know what I mean? Yeah. Shredded. Yeah. They're impossibly shredded. Yeah. I think they're CGI shredded. They to have be to be, right? Yeah. Too shredded. That movie kicks out. You can't be too shredded. No. You work out, right? Um, I do. Yeah. I do. It's funny you mention that. <laughs> I, um, I like to say that I work out for roles. Mm hmm because I feel like it makes me sound like a dick if I just say I work out, but I think in life I just, I, I work out. I would think the opposite. It makes you sound bro, you know what I mean? I don't think so, if you you, taking you good lift, care of yourself. You lift, bro? Well, no, you lift, bro, makes you sound like a bro. But that's like, what I always say. Yeah, but do you work out could mean you jog around a pond full of ducks and that's geese. That's what I do. You know, it's magical. There's rainbows and butterflies. Yeah. That's, there's nothing bro about that. It sounds like my workout. Yeah, I, I do. I'll admit it here on, on okay. the chat show. I, I work out. Great. Good, yeah. good for you. Why do you ask? Uh, well, we were talking about dudes being uh, jacked up. <sighs> Aren't dudes great? No, oh, they're the best. <sighs> they're so big. Um, yeah, I don't, I mean, if I took my shirt off, which I will in a minute if you want me to. You would not be the I first to do I don't look so. like the people from 300. Okay. I'll tell you that. Well, we have a very talented CGI team oh. up there by oh, the great. TriCaster. Okay. And they can instantly yeah. change it. Yeah. Okay. So if you want, don't, sp you know what? I Make do it want. A surprise. Make it a surprise. Okay. At some point in the interview, just rip your shirt off and they'll, they'll have their finger on the button. You yeah, got it. our first guest to take his shirt off was Fred Willard and the CGI made him look not Ooh. a day over 60. Yep. Really? Yeah. I've never heard take his shirt off and Fred Willard in the same <laughs> sentence. This that was true. incredible. It cost, it broke the, the, the budget of the entire show. It cost two and a half million dollars. <laughs> wow. Yeah, but worth it, but worth it. I love Fred Willard. Um, so now we, we've done exhaustive research on you, but I'm not sure that some of it's 100% accurate. So forgive me. It's my understanding that it. when you were 16 months old, you started DJing at nightclubs. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you almost have it right. Is that accurate? It's not accurate. However, when I was, I want to say two, okay. I was thrown out of a nightclub, true story. I'm going to need to hear this story. The please. nightclub uh, was the limelight. Familiar? Oh, well, I am familiar. Okay. Yeah, Peter um, Gation. Iconic sort of, I don't want to say a sex club, but you know, a, sex a, shit yes, went down a, very, a lot a in New York. very popular New York nightclub in the 80s, 90s. And I was um, a baby model, mm -hmm. as I'm sure you can still tell. Obviously. And I was with Ford models, mm -hmm. and Ford was having a party, and my dad brought me because all the clients were invited, and he thought, oh, like, they probably want me to bring my two-year-old to the limelight. Naturally. So we went and we were having a great time, apparently, and then the event was over and the club just became the club, but my dad, being Pete Masterson, didn't leave. Sneaky Pete. And we're just hanging out at the limelight as I'm two, and like an hour into it, a bouncer comes up and says, he obviously doesn't have ID. How does he know That's my don't story. Have ID? He obviously doesn't have ID. Profiling. Pretty presumptuous. Profiling. What if what if you were like uh, you had the the Benji buttons thing going on? Uh, agreed. You know, what What's if you What's the name of the baby from um, Roger Rabbit? Baby Herman. Baby Herman? Mm -hmm. What if it was a Baby Herman situation? What if it was a Baby Herman situation? Right. That bouncer doesn't know. Right. We should find him and set him straight. He'll rue the day. He really will. <laughs> um, well, that's uh, that's very exciting. Uh, thanks, man. You 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 started. You the, talking the about my limelight story? The corruption started so young in your life. Yeah, that's where it began. Um, Sixteen months old, I guess. I guess that's when I started working. Right. I would do like um, commercials and and print stuff for. All the baby things, diapers yeah. and applesauce and, yeah. and the whole nine. So, I have so, no memory of so any of it. So sweet Carol Masterson and Sneaky Pete. Yeah, they, they, looked at they this, made a baby. They made a baby. They made a couple babies. And that was my brother, Danny. Yep. That wasn't me. Nope. And then four years later, right. they had sex one more time Just and they that. made a second baby. Yep. Voila. There you are. And they went, look at how attractive this baby is. Yeah. We should be this making money gorgeous. off of this attractiveness. Agreed. And so that's how it started. Yeah, it started as like, you know, we lived on Long Island and it's like mm -hmm. extremely suburban there. Oh, so yes. in the summer there was, it's, it was very kind of like, what do you do in the summer with your kids? You, right. you go, like you join the town pool or something or what do we do? And my mom was like, oh, we should go in the city and try like modeling and acting that might be fun for the summer. And so we tried it as a one summer like thing to get us till school started again. Yeah. And then it's just kind of kicked off from there. And it went pretty well. 
Uh, yeah, it's gone all right. Well, I mean, in it's, the, been, it's been fine. It's been okay. It's it been seems fine. like it worked out. Yeah. Boy, our, our listeners, all we, I got. A lot of people only just listen to off. the show. They don't yeah. watch it. Dogs. They are going to be so confused as to what just happened. Agreed. Um, <laughs> so here's, here, I want to jump around just a little bit. We're going to jump around about, about 10 years from, from whence you started. Great. Because uh, this was fascinating to me. Now, when you were 11 years old, you burned down a 10-acre field. Now, most arsonists, they build their way up to a crime of that size, but not yeah. you. That, that, is a, that is quite a heist for an 11-year-old. Do you want embellishment not to get in the way of a good story, or do you want me to tell you what actually happened? I want you to give me the most entertaining story. And I mean that, like, the story. off the air, which story you want me to tell right now? Off, off the record, mm -hmm. you should tell the most entertaining version because okay. you know this is probably the only time we'll ever have you. Yeah. So, so yeah. So the truth. Um, I uh, was in a club called the Pyros. Oh boy. I was eleven. It's the best we could think of. Can you just pause for one quick second, Jamie? Can we check the statute of limitations in uh, the state uh, of New York on being in a club? On being in an, ar an arsonist club. An arsonist okay. club. Okay. Thank you. Continue. Um, and we would essentially just light stuff on fire. That's what we did. <laughs> but it wasn't as exciting as it sounds. It'd be like, we'd take like a pot, yeah. and we'd take some leaves, and we'd light them on fire and watch it burn. And it was like extremely exciting. Oh, sure. There were three members in the club, by the way. Uh, I think it was Greg and Pete. Um, anyway, one day we were in a, a field near my town, mm -hmm. and we were lighting some grass on fire. Okay. And the grass started burning and wind came and we were like, holy shit. So we started stomping out the grass yeah. and it was kind of burning our legs. Yeah. It was a grass area about as big as this table. Yeah. That was the entire story. That's it? Yeah. I guess if you think about it, the field itself could have been 10 acres. So maybe it's possible we burn in a 10 acre field. All right. But no, I never burned down anything bigger than the size of this table. Go nice, on. Nice fucking research. This story was supposed to take a half hour. Where was that from, that research? Uh, that one, I think, might have actually come from an interview you did with Seventeen Magazine back in 2000. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> that math sounds about or, right. Or as I like to call it, vintage Masterson. Agreed. <laughs> um, another another uh, nugget that I found uh, out about you, and th this was news to me because you and I have known each other truly for some time. Um, if you weren't in showbiz, you'd like to be a sewer diver in Mexico. Is, that, is this accurate? It's like when you're a teenager yep. and you have to do interviews, yeah. you don't really know who you are, and I guess you're not fully comfortable just telling the truth. Yep. So you say shit like that. Right. And I think um, it was a case of that. It was, uh, I think I was doing an interview and someone said, you know, what would you be doing if you weren't acting? Yeah. Instead of being like, I don't know. I was like, you know, and my, I lowered my voice. Yeah. Be a uh, Mexican sewer diver. Because I had read an article about the world's most dangerous jobs, and apparently there's a real job, it's a sewer diver. Yeah. The pipes or what have you, they get, they'll literally get like couches and stuff stuck in them, and these guys have to go down and saw them apart underwater wearing snorkel gear, but in human shit. And yeah. that's what they do for a living. And so I threw that out there. But no, I, I, I never wanted to be a Mexican sewer diver. So that story is the equivalent of you getting like a foghorn leghorn lower back tattoo at 17? Is that a reference to something specific? No, I just made that particular example up. Yes, it's a lot like it's what you just like said. It's a lot like that, where you're like, at the time, it seemed like a great idea. For sure. Yeah. And to be fair, maybe it was a great idea. Maybe other, you know, 15-year-old people read that story and were like, this guy is so interesting. Yeah. I want to watch him more. Yeah. But today, it doesn't apply. Well, the, the, the market has changed. Agreed. You know, the internet was not yeah. what it is today back in, back in 2000. Y yeah. Let's be honest. I think the, what we're also establishing is that you so far have zero facts about me, correct? I told you. There's not a these single thing be... you've said that's the actual that's, truth. That is true, although all of these are from your own old interviews. Agreed. And some so, of them are because of my own lies. Okay, so we're catching up. There's a lot going on here that I think we need to uncover. Okay. This one I did not find in any interviews, and so you're going to set the record straight. So I've got you as a baby, as a very handsome child in, uh, in the Long Island, New York area. Okay. Growing up. 
But how do you make the move to LA? When does that happen? Oh, interesting question. What is that? We came out a few times for pilot season. Okay. Just to audition. I think the first time, I'm not sure how this works or makes sense, I was three and I don't remember that. No, why would you? But we came and we stayed at the Oakwoods. Ah, the famous Oakwoods. Yes. Which is now in that show, Love, as like Springwoods or something oh, yeah. like that. But it's clearly the Oakwoods 100%. and it's so great because I'm like, yeah. I did stuff in that jacuzzi and like I've been on that balcony. <laughs> um, so uh, is this true that one of your first Probably. on-screen roles was for the movie Beethoven's Second. And yeah. you and, and your brother Danny both auditioned for the film independently. Yes. And you both got the parts that you were auditioning for. Go on. But you didn't tell the producers that the two of you were brothers in real life. And so? When they figured it out, they cut you out of the they, movie. They canned me. Yeah, it's true. Um, That's a dreadful We both story. auditioned for Beethoven second, different roles. Yep. He had a much bigger role. Yep. And they went over to, I think, Montana and, and shot a wonderful picture. And then when they were done, they came back to LA and shot a few days in LA and I was in one or some of those scenes. And then, um, I guess it was Ivan Reitman who had made the film, was watching it. And when my scene came on, he was like, Hang on a second. <laughs> and went to his internet, which yeah. existed then. Sure. And looked me up and was like, I feel like he's and called casting. They're like, oh yeah, they're brothers. And they didn't like it at all. And it no. was probably, frankly, really distracting because then at least I think we looked a lot alike. Sure. Now I think we look Somewhat. sort of a lot alike. Yeah. And uh, and I was I was fired after working. I was I was cut out of the film. Mm. I was left on the cutting room floor. It's not a, it's, I live on the cutting room floor, man. I've been there. Yeah. Yeah. It's a rough one. Yeah. Um, well, thank you for, for shedding some light on that uh, horrible Inside Hollywood story. Yeah, of course. Um, I feel like. That's when I turn to drugs and, and alcohol. I mean, like if anything, people are watching this interview and they're going, wow, Sam is asking him a lot of really inappropriate questions. He's usually nicer to the guests. Yeah, and, or and more likely, Chris Masterson is a really fucked up guy. No, 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 no. You're a delight and oh, everybody knows it. Okay. Believe me, everybody knows it. I mean, you're an arsonist and you urinate in cars, but other yeah. than that, who doesn't really? Agreed. Um, I feel like we should let people in on, on how you and I uh, have, have come to know each other so well. Please. Uh, so you and I uh, worked together for the first time, which was hard to believe for all the years I'd known you. The first time we actually worked together was in uh, a film called Made for Each Other. Wasn't it? It really was. And uh, boy, oh boy, oh boy, do I love the time we spent making that movie. I found and out the finished product. so much about you on that film. Oh, for boy. instance, yep. I found out that you can't contract herpes. This is, this Which is, a lot of people don't know about you. This is mostly... That's, that's, but I think uh, that should be on your is, eHarmony profile. That's not something I typically boast about to the uh, to the world at large, but yeah, it's true. Do you want to tell a story? Because it's really cool. Yeah, it's, Do you um, want me to tell my version of the story? You can tell any version you'd like. Knock yourself out. Sam's father is a chemist. No, we're going to move on from that because we can't... <laughs> I can't let you get... He has an actual career to... To worry about. Okay. I, I don't have a career in medicine. What's your dad's career? He's in, He's a dentist. But he's, he if was I said on this chat show your dad is a chemist, yeah. do you think his dental practice would fall through the floor? It might. Because you might. just got very protective. Well, I, I, here's the thing. I can say anything I want. It's just me and Mike right here. I don't want to put words in his mouth. Let me try again. Yep. Sam's father is a dentist. This is accurate. And at some point, an experiment was run on the blood of him, sure. Sam, and his brother. Yep. This experiment yep. essentially showed, the conclusion was that none of them are able to contract herpes. As many herps as they would inject mm -hmm. into the blood, mm -hmm. the blood would mm -hmm. always fight it off naturally. Oh. And the three of them have yeah. since lived mostly herpes free. Mostly. I want you to know your attention to detail when others are storytelling is second to none. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and on top of that, I want you to know <laughs> that, that every, everything you just said is 100% medically sound. And I would know because I'm a doctor scientist.
Um, about 2% of that story is accurate as you retell it, but right. that's okay. okay. The point is, the long of the short of it is... Yeah, we can uh, edit this show. We can do anything we want. And it'll look perfect. Uh, neither my father, my brother, myself, nor any of the men in my bloodline have ever contracted herpes, despite what I'm told has been repeated exposure. So regardless of what I said, yeah. it was the truth in the end. Sure. Great. It doesn't matter which way we take, the roads all lead to the same conclusion. This is really cool. Yeah. If you think about it. I will. The worst thing about getting herpes would probably just be having to tell people that you're going to sleep with that you have herpes. Sure. Right? Like the herpes itself is like, it's like getting a zit. Or yeah. Something. It's my understanding. It's fairly benign unless you're dealing with uh, the herpes that cause uh, cancer. I didn't know about those herpes. I yeah. I yeah. think that's a thing. I think you're thinking of HPV. Well, it's, it's a form of, of herpes, I think. I don't think that's You true. don't think that's accurate? Is there uh can we know? Anyone anyone with a strong background in medicine <laughs> or dentistry. Human or dentistry. Human papilloma virus. Yeah. Well, your I, dad's a dentist. I want to say can we call your can we get the dentist on the phone? Get a yeah. lifeline. Can we call here? Harris? Yeah, we probably can call Harris. Let's call Let's Harris. See. I want, I want to, to say they're not related, except they're both viruses. For the record, my father, who is watching this show right now, literally just texted me, completely herpes free. <laughs> <laughs> that is not a joke. That is really what he just texted me. Oh, boy. Uh, I'm not, I, we can call Harris if you really want, but uh, you know what? Let's call Harris. Give him a call. All right. <clears throat> we have an hour and a half here. Yeah, we got some time. He says, well, I don't even have to call him. He says, HPV different from herpes, so I will, I will uh, agree to that. Thank you. But I will, uh, there we go, we got him on the speaker. He can verify. Uh, hey, uh, ha Dr. Harris Levine, this is uh, Sam Levine. You're live on the air. Uh, just want to verify the story. i to turn you down. There is no, uh, there is no herpes in the bloodline. You believe we have a genetic immunity that is correct? Yeah, we're all, all of us are immune from herpes. That's what I thought. Okay, thank you very much for chiming in. Herpes is different. All right, all right. You, yeah, we know, we know that much. We have the internet. All right, thank you very much. Goodbye. So it's basically like you guys have a real mutation, like yeah. you are X-Men, but your X-Men power yeah. is that you can't, can't contract get herpes. herpes. Yeah. That's really it's cool. It's a good power to have. Some people can shoot fire from their eyes. Right. Some people can become other people. Right. Wolverine can't be killed. Magneto can move things through yeah. telekinesis. Yeah. No, you I can't get herpes. Can't get the herpes. And you'll never have the conversation. Neville. Neville. You're never going to have the I'm conversation. I'm never going to have Where you say, I got herpes. Yeah. Do you still want to sleep with me? Yeah, it's true. I never have to have that conversation. I thought of a cool idea for a website, which has since come out. This is 15 years ago. It was, um, it's called, or was going to be called, IHaveIt2.com. Oh. And it would be a dating site like eHarmony or something like that. Sure. For people with STDs. Ah. And you could go on and look for people who had the thing that you had. Sure. So you wouldn't have to have that awkward conversation where you said, hey, I, I have, have crippling this. gonorrhea. Agreed. So do you. Thing? Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. That anyway, is I thing. told a friend in tech about it. He said, that's a great idea. And then we never did anything about it. And four mm. or five years later, those sites are a thing now. Are they really? Yeah. Wow. That's, that's hard to believe. Uh, actually, it's not that hard to believe. I think a lot of people have some stuff. I guess they do. Yeah. I wouldn't How know. do we move out of this? Well, you said, I was, we're talking about made for each other. And you said you learned some interesting uh, things about so me. So many things about with you. That. What else did you learn um, about me? I don't know. Like, you're definitely... This isn't the right uh, term to describe you because it makes it sound like you're boasty and uh, and you're not. But mm. what's another way to say know it all, but in a in a good uh, like that reflects kindly on the person? You know everything about everything is what I discovered on that movie That's as well. That's very sweet of you to say. You're a walking uh, Jeopardy contestant. Knowledgeable. Is that how you say be. it? Sure. I feel like knowledgeable is really boring. But yeah, you're knowledgeable. You're an incredibly knowledgeable. See, the story just got so boring once you said that. Well, I'm sorry. Ah. Sam Levine knows literally everything about every subject and can quote anything he's ever read about anything. Was that is that a fair statement? I would say I have pr uh, uh, a higher than average retention when I read or hear things. See. Well, we you were just discussing my point. before the show started, he was spouting out some trivia, and I'm like, that's common knowledge, and nobody else knew that. And I think we're just like... Are you the same like way? Well, I'm more oh, just like, I like, like, I like trivia. Yeah. 
so, or like useless, I don't know, I'm full of useless yeah. facts. When you yeah, watch Jeopardy, do you know? See, now Jeopardy to me is one of those things that it's like, if you just watch it often, you can figure out the answers by like the theme of the category. It's okay. not necessarily like you actually know the answer. It's just like, it's almost like a puzzle. It's like kids in school who sense? just learn how to take tests, yes. but don't necessarily learn all the information. Yes. I like how you put that. Did we just get into a school conversation? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I don't think this is the, the, the long-standing debate of, what is it? Uh, School testing? No, the standardized testing. Not standardized testing. Core, uh, the math. Core, no. uh, core, common core. Common core, or common uh, core. Common core. Do we just get into a Trump conversation? <laughs> no, nope, not on this show. We're talking about made for each other around these parts. Speaking of made for each other, a lot of people like you who know everything or retain information, <laughs> and like yourself, no she's very. You guys always kind of push that on the rug by saying it's useless information. But it's commonly information that's very useful on a daily basis. Like it comes up in conversations and you just know everything about everything and you don't know what it's like to be a person who knows nothing about anything. You know what I was thinking? Walk in those shoes for a day. I don't I think you're just, in those I'm shoes. Not, but at the same time, like I'm not embarrassed to ask questions. Like if I don't understand something. Oh yeah, no, I'm the same I'll way. ask a question. And people love, love when you do that because they love to give you the answer and they love talking about themselves right. or just talking. So it doesn't hurt to ask questions either. It's another simple way to learn. Like asking a question does not make you less intelligent. Right. And I yeah. think that people find think that. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. I mean, what she's even referring to is we were discussing the fact that ABBA did not speak English before recording their first album. Is it ABBA in or ABBA? States. ABBA, ABBA, you say ABBA, and I say banana ABBA. Man. Herpes, herpes, bo burpees, banana, <laughs> banana, herpes. We can't get away from we it. We can't. We try. Well, you you can't trend. get away from That's herpes. That's the thing about herpes. That's the thing. You try and you try and you try. You cannot get away from it. Keeps on giving. Oh, <laughs> that was from Krusty's late night stand up. It gets a little, <laughs> it gets a little blue. <laughs> What's the Jeffrey Tambor quote from um, Hangover about herpes? Oh. I don't, that one I don't remember. He said, uh, it's the first time I've ever seen you stumped. Well, oh, yes. was it? Yeah. I say it as if I knew it and I was mm -hmm. going to say it, but I don't know what it is. Probably. We might want to look that up at some point. Something it's about pretty what, stay, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, except, except herpes. for herpes. That shit, that shit, that shit stays follows you. Stays yeah. I'm sure it was something like that. Genius. Seems like a tough line Speaking to write. Speaking of made for each other, yeah. I learned a lot about you. Uh, did you shave? Your ass, or does it just look like that? Oh no, I, you know I shaved my ass. I can't ass. fully remember, as we've established on this show, yeah. I remember next to nothing, yeah. but I have a picture. Yeah, I know you do. I wish I could find it right now, of me posing right next to your butt cheeks. Let's see if I can find it. A thing I learned about Sam is he has oh. like an ass double ass. I get it? He has a butt that looks like a butt that they put in movies to be the butt of the star who's supposed to have a really nice butt, but just for some reason doesn't. Guilty Is that as fair? charged. Do you have a picture here? Uh, I don't have that picture that you're referring to, and I'm almost glad I don't have that picture. I hope you just don't pull up to. another random picture of your own butt. No, I'm pulling weird. up a screenshot from the movie mm. made for each other. Great. So, uh, wait till you guys see this ass. I mean, I feel, Kenny, you're gonna have to zoom in on an iPhone here. So, all of our audio only listeners, boy, are you missing out. There you go. Wow! At home viewers. <laughs> that is a screenshot from the motion picture made for each other, wherein I bared my bare ass. Incredible. There it is. It getting, looks like a CGI'd right. ass. It almost does. It looks like the it 300 gentlemen does. came and made a perfect ass on your body. Yeah. And uh, and I'm I'm forever grateful to them for doing that. Three million dollars in surgery it took me to get wow. that ass to look that way. It's incredible. Uh, the line is: Remember, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, except for herpes. That shit'll come back with you. We got it. Genius. Um, and. Uh, so yeah, I did have to shave my ass for that because you know, not a secret. I'm a hairy guy. I was gonna ask, are and you? Would you? What would you qualify as? Uh, like on the gay dating scene, is it? I know there's like there's a bear I and then there's I would be like an a otter. otter. I believe I so would an, be an otter, otter means you're of smaller stature, right? Or you're just not. You're, it means you're hairy, but you're not big and fat. Got you. Yeah. Uh, how does it feel to be an otter? Yeah, <laughs> it's been working great. Would you say it's an otter? 
<laughs> no. There it is! Classic. Jamie Foxx. One of the better puns of the day. Bringing it in. Uh, yeah, so, uh, but look. Hang on, let's people... not skip over this. Yeah. Does your ass look like your beard? No. No. No, it's not JoJo if the we dog. we saw you from across the room. Man. If we saw you from 50 feet away, would yeah. we say that guy has a really hairy ass? No, 50 feet away, I don't, I don't know the, it's not like a thick layer. It's not like I'm wearing an ass sweater. Would you show us? No. Okay. No, this is a family show, okay. sir. Go Plus, on. Uh, I'm, you know, I gotta be on the clock if mm -hmm. you want, if you want to see the goods. Okay. Um, but, uh, but yeah, no, I, I had to shave it because I was like, look, I'm about to show my ass on camera forever. In Smart. fact, my whole backside. Yeah. Which. Oh, your back. Is hairy too. Every part of me is hairy. I I got the shit end of the of the Ashkenazi Jew stick on well, this you one. You can't man. get herpes, so. That's true. I'll take that. Yeah. It's a small price to pay for the hairiness. Do you, you laser that shit off? I was gonna ask. Isn't that a thing where like I don't think I can do that because I'm not dark enough. But yeah. if you have dark hair, you can just laser any part of your body, and there will never be ha there, hair there again. Is that the thing? That is technically how it works, I believe. But it's like many, many visits over a long period of time. And but what is that? Eight visits? Uh, I visits? think it's different for everyone but it can get very costly and expensive, and even then, it's not a guarantee. Mm. Yeah. I think our hair is too dark. I know, people always suggest that to me. They're like, it just laser, just laser. And I'm just like, no, my yeah. hair's too dark. Plus, what, what do you He's mean it's Jewish. too dark? I'm, hey, my hair, I'm, a, I'm half Italian. My hair's like very dark and coarse. Yeah. So you're saying you wouldn't want to get laser? I would, but I just don't think it would take. Oh, I, I think, think like the, the darker that, the hair is, the more it takes. Oh, see, I feel yeah, like Yeah, that's it's what like I've heard people. as well. Oh, okay. Hmm. But yeah, if you have blonde yeah, hair, we I think not be it, in this discussion on the it. laser no. does it. <laughs> this isn't being Here's recorded, the thing. though. The reason it? I'm I'm nervous to do it, and this is the truth. The reason I'm I'm a little hesitant is what if I find myself in a revenant type situation mm -hmm. and I need the hair for warmth? Yeah. And then I'm going to be like, why did I spend eight grand lasering it all off? Yeah. It could be saving my life right now. These are not rhetorical questions. Now I have to climb inside of this dead horse. Yeah. Yeah. To cut open that tauntaun and go to sleep. I gotta cut open that tauntaun and get in there. Oh. I thought about the same thing because I have a friend who got the lower portion of his neck lasered. Mm -hmm. And I thought two things. One, what if like neck hair becomes like a thing, yeah. you know, like fedoras were for a while. Sure. <laughs> Additionally, what if there's a post-apocalyptic situ situation where you need like hair, as much hair on your body as possible. Yeah. And there'll be this whole breed of people in society today who've gotten rid of their hair, the same people who have like full sleeve tattoos, and they're all going to be dead within minutes. Minutes. Just a thought. But I will stand. What's wrong with a full sleeve tattoo? Nothing is wrong with the full sleeve tattoo. But I will say, as a, a gentleman who I could have one. has you some tattoos, know. maybe I do. I'm a fan of tattoos. <laughs> this is not me ripping on tattoos. I but here's what I'm saying: there was a time where when you had a tattoo or ten, it made you kind of hard. Oh, it was absolutely. Kind of like, now it's oh, so common. Check that out. Now it's almost like the thing would be to rebel is to just not have any tattoos, mm -hmm. right? That would make you hard. They're very right. commonplace. I'm gonna show you guys. Do you have my... a full sleeve tattoo? Uh, uh, three quarter. Yeah, I like See, that. That's, what's that? I'm I gonna, said I like that. Yeah. I'm gonna need to show you guys my foghorn leghorn tattoo on my lower back because <laughs> it used to be something I, I had regret for, but now I've I've grown to love it. Can we see it? Later. Um, made for each other. We're gonna get there. We're gonna actually talk about this movie. Let's do it. So uh, let's see who else is in this movie. Who good else people. Is it in this good movie? people. Do you have a list? Uh, off the top of my head, I got yeah. I got some names. We got uh, your bro, bro, Mr. Yeah. Danny Masterson. Uh huh. We got our other uh, bro, bro, Mr. Kyle Howard. The best. The best. Uh, Danny's uh, now wife and uh, baby mama. Go on, Ms. Bijou Phillips. Right to make out with. Very That's awkward. That's right. Little oh, awkward. Oh man, what a weird long history of you and your brother <sighs> and making out with the same person. Making out with what the are you same gal. About? Well, sometimes for show. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. All right. I mean, we don't have to go down that road, but it's not the first time. Touche, my it's friend. It's not the first time. Uh, and then... Uh, we have Alana Masterson, my sister. That's right. Alana Masterson is in the movie. Who may have the best line in the movie. I don't remember what it was. Uh, I'm a high school girl, and even I'm getting laid. I think it was... I think it was much worse than that, but I, I think, think that right. was the concept. That yeah. was the, the conceit behind it. Was it is an amazing line. That everyone in the world is getting laid, but your character in that movie. Yeah. And he's married, and his, new, his newlywed wife is not sleeping with him. Mm -hmm. And what do you do? What do you do? And that's what the movie Made for Each Other tries to answer. I mean, I don't want to give away any plot points. 
I feel like the trailer kind of let people know what you do, and then mm. we wouldn't give away what, what came happens, of what that. happens. Patrick yeah. Warburton, Patty Warbucks. I usually try to not name people in movies because I feel like, fuck, if I name that guy and don't name this person, they're gonna get butt hurt. But I can't remember all of the people because sure. the cast will have like 30 people on it. Yeah. Well, you got George Siegel, Leslie Hendricks. Oh yeah. Um, we had a lot of good, a lot of good folk in that. A lot of good folk. Um, and uh, and I miss all of them. I wish they could all be here with me today so I could hear all of their... For the 300. Tattoo stories and urinating in cars. And yeah. We could talk about the herps with everyone. For hours. But uh, but they can't be. We've got you, and I'm glad. Can I just say before we pass over this? Yeah. Sneaky Pete, my father... In the movie. ...is in Made for Each Other. Damn right he is. He plays the gardener. Yeah. And he crushed it. He did crush it. There is not... There is not a bad performance in that movie. Agreed. Even my brother has a role as an extra in the film. Oh, yeah. Sweet Max Levine I is I remember a, seeing that and being plays like, delivery who is man. that extra? Yeah. This is extraordinary. Yeah. He's, it's, it, that was it. You know what it was? That was a, uh, that was a family project right there. Mm -hmm. A lot of family involved. I feel that way. <clears throat> if ever I'm involved in a project where I have any say about anything, yeah. I'm just looking at my actual Rolodex of friends. And I'm like, I, I know all these guys and girls who yeah. crush it all the time. Why would I go see like 150 other people? You're telling me this guy who's been in 20 things isn't right for anything in this movie. Yeah. And you just throw your bros in. That was, that's absolutely the way to do it. And when that happens, you get an experience like that, mm -hmm. which I think is really, to be honest, a very special experience. It really was a, a tremendous one. Uh, the movie was uh, written by Eric Lord and directed by our friend Daryl Goldberg. And um, here's the good news. I'm not just whistling Dixie about this movie and you're like, oh, well, maybe I'll never see it. You can see it right now for $3, you now? cheap bastards. I mean, as soon as this interview is over, I want you to go to either the Google Play Store or uh, Amazon Streaming. Nice. And for two ninety nine, you can watch Made for Each Other that instant. Nice. And I, I highly recommend that you do. Yeah. It is raunchy. It is silly. It is goofy. It is sweet. It is funny. We do a musical version of Waterworld. Oh, I forgot about that. Waterworld the musical happens in this movie. That's true. Starring Patrick Warburton. Yeah. As the Mariner. As the Mariner. Yeah. Yeah, now you want to see this yeah, movie, wow. don't you? What, now I want to see this movie. Um, I'll tell you something that happened on that movie uh, uh, for me that I found very interesting, and you're going to like this transition, was uh, you did a little second unit directing. I did. Yeah, you did. Yeah. And uh, and that was that was maybe one of the most fun days I had was when you were directing me in the second unit stuff. Yeah. Nothing against Daryl Goldberg, who's a great director. Daryl's great, but well, it was I'm more fun, I would say. Well, you and I had a shared history before the movie, and so it's fun to be directed by your friend. Very much so. Yeah. We do. We or I directed a, a <clears throat> commercial. Yeah, commercial within the movie. Yeah. For and a, for an attorney. And the concept was that uh, the attorney right is. Um, you know, shoots one of these like you know three hundred dollar budget right. commercials where he he himself is in the in the ad. Yeah, yeah. And then he has testimonials from his former clients, which are actually just his friends or hot girls, right? Et cetera, et cetera. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That was real fun. That was very silly. What we we did got then. to frame everything, kind of screwed up. Yep. And weird editing. Yep. And there's the double. I, well, I don't want to say the. I don't want to People watch it. You watch it. and You enjoy the hell out of it, folks. And if you're a stickler, you're like, no, I'm 80 years old, and I insist on having physical media. You can also buy the DVD on what? Amazon for like 12 and a half bucks. And they'll deliver it to your home. They'll bring it to your door by tomorrow. That's I don't know incredible. what part of the country they're watching this in. They will probably deliver it to your home by tomorrow if you want. You Possibly might even be able to get it drone. tonight. By drone. I hope not. <laughs> you hope no drone delivery for you. I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of this whole drone culture I just thing happening. Make a joke. Yeah. Like, do you remember when they were going to put a, a billboard in space and that was a thing for a little while? I don't. They were, they were, there was Ford or someone was trying to put an actual physical billboard of some sort yeah. in space. Did this news come up yesterday? Because it was April 1st. This is like <laughs> 15 years ago, but it was on April 1st. Uh -huh. So I guess I got got. You might have got got. But I thought, man, that's going to suck if you're going to look up in the sky and see, you know, uh, a Chrysler ad or something. And I feel like that's the thing about drones is like, every time I look up living in LA now, I see some asshole's drone flying around. Yeah. And they can fly right over your house and you hear the buzzing. So when Amazon, think about, you know, every neighbor I have has 80 Amazon boxes outside their front door. When Amazon's delivering those boxes via drone, 
it's going to look like the Jetsons up there. I hadn't thought about it like this, and uh, now what do you think? I'm gonna I'm gonna get myself a shotgun, and I'm gonna go drone hunting. Funny you mention this because I was listening to a podcast yesterday called War College. Okay. Where they talk about, I think that it's like Reuters talking about <clears throat> the behind the lines type of things that happen in war, and and ISIS is now using drones to blow people up but they're using the drones that they order in one day on Amazon yeah. and modifying them. Right. So the military now has rifles, which are really just like a weird radio antenna thing, that they can shoot these drones out of the sky via, uh, like, I guess, uh, waves yeah. like technology, and it just melts the drone. And what I'm wondering is, can I order one of those overnight on Amazon and shoot out of the sky all of my neighbor's drones? Get to the bottom of this. Get back to me. <clears throat> Siri, get me Jeff Bezos. Siri just told me to go no. fuck myself. Wow. It's weird. No. Um, I want to get back to your career. Sorry to bum you out on the whole drone No, that's okay. You know what? Uh, what are you going to do? still in here. No, what are you going to do? Uh, so back to you as a child actor. Of course. You worked on a, an epic, an epic adventure known as Cutthroat Island. Yeah. Yeah. I did. Now, you and I have never talked about this, and boy, am I glad I found this out. Yeah. You pulled what I like to call a Sam Levine. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait. Would a Sam Levine be like being the third or fourth lead in something no. so that you like get seen a lot, but you don't have to show up every day all day and do a lot of work? Oh my God, that is my dream. No, that is the good Sam Levine. You pulled uh, the bad Sam Levine. Okay. And by that, I mean any time I've ever been asked in my entire career to do anything resembling a stunt. Oh, just jump from this platform to that one. It's one foot. You'll be fine. You've done it. I get horribly injured. Okay. It is my understanding you suffered a series of injuries on the set of Cutthroat Island. Yeah, you're right. You were electrocuted. I was. You were bitten by a horse and pulled off of your saddle. Uh, yeah, I was. You were bitten on the face by a monkey. Yeah. What the fuck is Rennie Harlan doing? Today? No, in the, on this set. Um, you know, I, they all seemed like freak incidents that wouldn't normally happen, but they all happen in a condensed period of time. The only defense I would give him if I were his lawyer is that <laughs> that shoot took six months. Yeah. It was l legit. Half a year of filming. Yeah. So if, if something normally takes 30, 45 days, maybe two and a half months, like triple, quadruple, maybe up to six times that length of time went by. Yeah. So if we had had a 30 day shoot, maybe I only would have been bitten on the face by a monkey. What kind of monkey are we talking about? <laughs> you know, like your standard, like a, with the fur. Sp spider monkey? And the little cute. I don't think it was a spider monkey. It was okay. the monkey from like... Pirates of the Caribbean, the little one? That was about a decade later, so that would be surprising. Although I don't know how... Just the same how type of monkey. No, I meant the same type. Yeah, I didn't uh, mean the same exact monkey. I got real, real yeah. there for a second. Um, I don't know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you know the monkey from the movie with Thora Birch? Where she had a monkey? Oh, yeah. Um, what's the name of that horrible... Uh, oh, it's monkey not business. that darn cat. Monkey but, business. Oh, monkey business. Yeah. An equally good name. It was either that actual monkey okay. or that same breed of monkey. So a real cute monkey. And in the monkey's defense, <laughs> I had had this monkey on me for like you know, half a year or something like yeah. that. Yeah. The monkey was on me all the time and there was just a scene late at night where, I don't know, a lot of stuff was going by and there were a lot of extras dressed like pirates and someone bumped the monkey from behind me and it freaked out and just <laughs> thought my face was what was attacking it. Hey, Pepe, go for the face. <laughs> what, was, what was weird about it was, you know, a monkey's fangs, they, they're shaped kind of like this. Yeah. So it bit my face and went like in and then back out. There were four puncture holes. And when it tried to pull its teeth uh. out, it sucked my face off of my face. <laughs> Like, the skin came off of the skull, which I didn't know, but everyone around me said it looked like that movie where the dude, like, stretches, or like Berlin. in uh, in Beetlejuice, where yep. they, like, stretch out. Yep. My face oh, was Brazil. just like... Brazil. Not Berlin, Brazil. Brazil. Yep. Yeah. Terry Gilliam classic, Brazil. What about it? 
that's the, that's the stre stretchy the, face. Oh, yes, 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 yes. That's what Sam and I are here for. You vaguely reference something, and we tell you what you're referencing. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> yeah. I wish I had you guys with me all the time. <laughs> you can. Yeah. Anyway, that happened, and a lot of stuff happened. We were electrocuted. Stuff yeah. happened to other people, too. The horse thing is crazy, because this apparently is behavior that doesn't happen on horses normally. We were doing, uh, we were rehearsing for a scene where I think it's like Gina Davis is riding a horse, and Stan Shaw's riding a horse, and I'm riding a horse. Yeah. And I was the only dude who showed up for rehearsal that day, so it was me and two stunt people, or maybe it was Stan, I can't remember, as I have established. Anyway, we're riding, and we're, we're just riding down the beach, and the horse in the back will ride past you and get back in line, and you just keep riding past each other. One of the times, this horse goes riding by me, and it turns, and bites down on my leg, not like a like a horse nip, like an actual, yeah. like it just grabbed my leg and sunk into it, and I was like, oh, and lifts me off of my horse, and pulls me out into the air, so I'm hanging from a horse's mouth while we're galloping, and I'm looking like this, and my horse is right here, and then it drops me in between the two horses. I go tumbling on the sand or what have you. I get up and I'm like, oh my God. And I turn around and this horse is now charging me with a rider on it who's pulling his head. So the horse is like sideways and he's still like trying to get at it to stop me out of existence. So that happened. This is, this is criminal. It's crazy. Later in the movie, we're doing a scene out in the open ocean. Yeah. And no one wants to swim around me. Shark attack. That's what I'm thinking. That's what they all were expecting. Yeah. This kid, he's the Forrest Gump of animals that go crazy. Y yes. Yeah. Yes, I could, I could get him. What, was, what was the name of that, those Fox specials? When, good an when, when animals, animals attack? attack? Yeah. When animals attack? That's what it is. When animals attack, paren, if Chris Masterson is around. Classic. Classic. That should have been the name of that show. That movie, I think, started with what was one of the biggest budgets that had ever been when we started. Oh yeah. And it ended like, you guys are probably about to tell me, like around a hundred million. Mm -hmm. um, and it single-handedly, if I have this right, sunk Caraco Studios, which yes, has made a whole bunch of films that is before 100% that. accurate. Yes. It made like $14 million in the box office. Yeah, it tanked so hard. And that studio evaporated. I want you to know, I saw that movie in theaters. That means a lot to me. I did. I believe I saw it the same day as I saw Hackers. Oh, Angelina I Jolie. I believe was they were playing so at the same time. I might, I might have pulled a double feature on that one. Wow. Yeah. Wow, was Hackers that long ago? Yeah, Hackers was 95. This, yeah, I think right? this was 95. Yeah, 95. Yeah. Yeah. All I know is I was in eighth grade, so it would have been 95. Yeah. Angelina Jolie in Hackers yeah. is like one of the people I reference where you're trying to like talk about how good looking someone is on a scale from one to 10. Yeah. And and they say someone that doesn't make sense and you're like, no, like oh, I'm talking about like, you know, Cindy Crawford or, you know, this person or, or Angelina Jolie and Hackers, you specify. Mm. Because she was gorgeous in that movie. Yeah, I think she's gorgeous in, in all of her a movies. A lot of cool actors in that movie yeah. too. Yeah. You got, you got your Johnny Lee Miller? You got your Jesse Bradford. Yeah, yeah you, you do. You got your uh, your Fisher Stevens. Wow. Your Lorraine Bracco. Wow. Uh, who else we got? Oh, Renly. He just goes by Renly. One who is one that? name. Is he on he's Game the of guy. Uh, no, he's the guy who's like teamed up with uh, Matthew Lillard in the movie. Also in the movie, uh, he was in Con Air. Renly. Okay. I think he maybe goes by Renly Sant. Not not Rainy Santo. Renly Harlan. No, no. It doesn't matter. Um, My best friend's wedding. Is that a question? It's just a movie. Okay. Let's talk about it. You played Dermot Mulroney's younger brother in my yeah. best friend's wedding. That was now that's a big movie. That was a big that movie. That was no cutthroat that island at the movie box office. Didn't tank a studio. No. no which was cool. Renly Santiago. Thank you. I was close. Renly Santiago. Yeah. Does he actually go by Renly? Or he I goes believe by he, Renly just, he goes by just Renly sometimes. Maybe <sighs> Renly Santiago. I always wish I had a cool name. Like Ryder Strong or something, where I could just be. My, Ryder Strong was know? the last person I guest hosted an interview. Recently? Yeah. Love Bless you. Guy. Love that guy. He's the best. He's the best. Yeah. I actually haven't seen him in like 20 years, but. Do you know what he really does? Like he does not urinate in cars. So, wow. on that front, I'm much happier to have you here today. Wow. 
dick reference. No, I'm just saying, like... That was a pun. I, I want... Uh, I, I want the interestings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. You're saying 300's going way better than two something. 96, let's yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Something like that. Um, anyway, I love that guy. How do we get on him? Uh, uh, which oh, guy? a name. Like, you, like I, I couldn't just go by Chris. Right. That'd be an asshole move. But if your name's like Ren Lee or like Hermitage, you can yeah. just be the one name guy. I mean, admittedly, you you do go by Chris Kennedy for the DJing. Uh, I, I did, did for eight or nine years. Okay. And now I just go by my name. Chris Masters. Masterson. Um, we've met, I'm Chris Masterson. <laughs> In here all this time, I thought you were Chris Christopherson. Throwback to pre-show. Nice. <laughs> uh, wait a minute. We can't get too far off this. I want to talk about my best friend's wedding. Okay. You got your Jeremy Mulroney. You got your Cameron Diaz. You got your Julia Roberts. Yeah. There's more. Uh, there's a lot more. That's that's a that's a the guy from old... Sideways. Uh, Paul Giamatti, Thomas Hayden Church. Paul Giamatti. He's the bellman. Yep. Uh, uh, so I assume the, the the casting process on that one was probably very and typical. Rupert Everett, right? Rupert Everett, that's who I was trying to think of. Yeah, uh, yes. Was probably very... What happened to Rupert Everett? It's a good question. I feel like he was in everything for a little in while. In the 90s, and yeah, like in the mid And he was so funny. He had, a, he had a big moment, didn't he? But you know, every time I think what happened to that guy, I look on their IMDb and, and they've, they've done like, like for some fifty movies. For like, or they, or they whatever yeah. that happens to me, they've been on some procedural for like yeah. five years. Yeah, they've just been there. off making yeah. fifty million dollars. Right. He's, right. he's been on like exactly. a British like, what to that, guy? that ran for eleven seasons. Yeah, you're like, oh, I'm. Is that a thing? Because I would watch that. <laughs> it's going to be a thing now. Did we just make a million dollars? I believe that we did. Hats off to us. <laughs> that movie had a lot of cool actors in it. The casting process, if I remember correctly, was that there was a small scene they wanted me to read. Yeah. And I don't remember how many scenes the character had in the movie, but they only wanted this one small scene. And I thought, wow, that's what a cool thing. Like, how often do you get to go to an audition where you don't have 11 pages of dialogue? Right over four scenes that you have to memorize completely and go in and give it your all oh, yeah, with yeah. 25 other people waiting. They wanted like, you know, six lines and I read the six lines and then they just wanted to improv. And we just improvised about, I have no idea what, just like random stuff for 15 minutes or so. Yeah. And, uh, and then I left and uh, I went to Chicago. That was it? Yeah, that was it, in and out. If it could always be that easy. If only it could always be that easy. Um, well, that, that Oh, all right. I'll get to this next one in a second. I, I, I have to jump around because I know the hardcore fans of yours have been listening or watching now for a while, and I'm sure some of them are throwing, throwing tantrums. <sighs> Why have they not talked about Malcolm in the Middle yet? Ask me anything. What's Brian Cranston like? <laughs> He's a gem of a person. Uh, no, we love Cranston. We've had him on the show. He is a gem. Isn't he the uh, best? He is the best. It's funny because a lot of people work with people and are asked about them, and they all say that. Oh, love that person. Sure. But he was a guy in particular because we got to work together for seven years who he was just like he he wasn't faking it i think that's the biggest thing he wasn't yeah. just trying to be the very likable guy he was just or still is like the coolest guy he would work every single day and then you know on the sunday he'd go to like the 12th birthday party for our assistant cameraman's son yeah. kind of a thing yeah and then you know after we were done shooting at night he'd buy pizza for everyone and just sit and hang out with the crew like he's a really really solid guy he is a v and obviously very talented but sure. a lot of people don't get to see that side of him it's very cool yes it is um i my my first interaction with uh cranston which you'll maybe get a kick out of was at the 2001 emmy awards uh, which had been twice postponed on account of 9-11. And they wound up happening on a Sunday night uh, in November that unfortunately wound up being the seventh game of the World Series Yankees versus Diamondbacks. Uh, 
Wow. They were up against each other on the same night of television. And I was invited to the Emmys that year for some insane reason. And so I'm sitting in the back of the auditorium and we're all losing our minds because we know that game seven of the World Series is on. And I happen to be seated right behind Brian Cranston and uh, uh, two of your uh, other co-stars, uh, the uh, uh, Eric Persullivan and uh, Justin... Burfield. Burfield. Uh, we're sitting with Cranston in the back of the of the auditorium, and they go to the first commercial break, and we'll be right back, folks. And then Cranston pulls out one of those Sony <laughs> transistor radio. No, no, it was the the, the oh, Sony oh, like a Watchman, the little Watchman, the yeah. little little two and a half inch screen what a with the antenna, and he pulls it out and he's laying <laughs> the antenna, and now he's got the World Series game, oh my and God. then in the back of the of the room. Everyone is leaned over <laughs> to see on this little tiny screen, and Cranton's trying to hold it up high enough so everyone can see. And then every time they go, and we're coming back from commercial in three, two, one, oh, son of a bitch. That's and amazing. so then he kept having to put it away. And, uh, and then finally the producers got wise, and they started putting the game on, on the big uh, screen mm. in the theater during the commercial breaks. But that backfired fast because they cut to commercial, we'd start watching game seven of the World Series. And then they cut Something it off. super exciting was about to happen and then the screen would just roll up and an entire auditorium of angry, let's be honest, Jewish New Yorkers would go, Gah! And then poor Ellen, who was hosting, would have to walk back out, back out on the stage and go, all right guys, time to be silly again. <laughs> it was, uh, there were no winners that day. So did they stop playing it on the Jumbotron? No, they did for as long as they could. Uh, and then the game ended on Brian's screen while we were watching and mm. everyone was, I'm telling you, more people were upset about that game ending the way it did than they were about not winning Emmys that night. I thought you were gonna say the 9-11. <laughs> <laughs> Too soon? And then I was like, Sam. So then I said it for you. So then you said it. So then I How said it. How dare you, Jamal. <laughs> That's what I was doing. Uh, I apologize for taking 10 minutes to tell my Brian Cranston story. Great story. Well, I want to talk about you and your work on Malcolm. Do you have questions? I, 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 I just want to, I mean, that was a, here's my question. So, you know, you've, it's, it's not a secret. You were on the show. The show ran seven years. You played Francis, the oldest brother. You got into hijinks at the, uh, at the, at the boarding school. But in the last season of the show, you directed an episode called Hal Greaves. Is this true? Is this accurate? Yeah, it's okay. very accurate. And, uh, and I would like you to maybe share with us about how that came about. Uh, mainly because of Brian Cranston, to be honest. Brian Cranston God was damn. directing episodes of the show throughout the process. And yeah. He was a great director. He is a great director. Duh. And um, I had gone to film school before we had started shooting and I had wanted to be a director mm -hmm. at some point. Mm -hmm. And when him and I would have conversations about it, I, I, it was just a thing where I was like, oh yeah, like at, at some point in my career, I'll get back to directing because that was my favorite thing. And I used right. to make shorts on like 16. And he just, every like season or so, he'd be like, what are you doing with the directing thing? Like, like you gotta get one of these episodes. And I was like, of this, no, of this show? like. I can't, like my budgets were $18. There's, there's no, like I can't, he's like, yes you can. Yes you can, here's what you need to do. And he kept pushing mm -hmm. me and it just seems so daunting. Finally, um, I started shadowing some of our directors and watching him and some of the others work and, and really kind of like going to school on it. And I still didn't know if I want to do it. And one day he just stopped me in the hallway and asked me about it and pressed me. And he said, here's what you need to do. And he gave me this whole kind of like plan, like go talk to this person, put your foot down, say this has to happen in here. And, uh, and I went and did it. I, ha I had a meeting with Linwood, who was the creator. And I just mm. said, look, I, I, I'm not brand new to this. I've directed a bunch of stuff, but no one's ever seen it. And it was made for $4, but here's what it looks like and I'd really like to do an episode. And so they gave me a shot in our seventh season, mm -hmm. which ended up being our last season. Um, but that process, getting to do it on that scale, you know, I don't know what our budgets were, but say we're like in the two or $3 million range that you're spending yeah. over like six days with a crew of, you know, 70 or 100 people, like it was, it was mind blowing. Yeah. And the process to me still seemed the same. I knew what 
how I wanted to tell the story. I knew where I, we wanted to be looking from. I knew what I wanted to get from the actors. Uh, but I would go to do that, and there'd be 14 people ready to back up every decision. And inversely, there's 14 people at all times asking you questions about something that when you tell them, like, uh, I think they're red, they're going to go spend $50,000 on you know, a red vehicle yeah. or something. It's a lot. I didn't sleep the entire time, mm -hmm. but I was truly buzzing. I would wake up in the morning so excited to go to work, and sometimes we'd be shooting scenes, and my face would just start like smiling. Yeah. And so I just cover my face to not look like an asshole. Yeah. Because I was just sitting there grinning. It was it was the best. So since then, sometimes if I'm doing movies, I'll direct second unit stuff just to kind of exercise that a little bit so yeah. that someday I'll go and continue that thing. So I've gotten to direct you mm -hmm. and uh, and Brian Cranston. And, Same thing. And you know what? Pretty Same much. Same thing. Same thing as far as I'm concerned. Um, that's fantastic. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I, I hope you stick with that because if memory serves a fine director, sir. I think your memory serves you very well at oh, this good. moment. Oh, good. I'm so very, glad. Very, very well. Um, let's talk about Dragonheart, a new beginning. I was about to talk about anything besides Dragonheart. Yeah? So it's funny that you bring that up. Is it funny? Funny haha? -ha? Uh, yeah, it's funny haha. -ha. Just tell me about Slovakia. Slovakia is cool, man. Uh, we were in Slovakia doing... So I auditioned for Dragonheart, the sequel to Dragonheart. Right. Like, oh, dra like, that sounds cool. Right. There's Dennis Quaid. Uh, Sean Connery. Sean Connery being a dragon yeah. voice yeah. and like... Awesome, and you know, You're I'm a man huge now, fan dog. of dragons. Different movie, I is know. that Finding Forrester? It is, I just wanted reference. to say that <laughs> as Sean Connery. And so, um, Y'all the dragon now, Chris. Is that close Yeah, to? yeah, I, okay. think, I think we're getting there. Okay. I read for it and I got it, and I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Yeah. What are the details? And they're like, oh, well you shoot in Slovakia. And yeah. I was like 18, I was like, awesome. And they said, um, you, uh, you know, you're going to be shooting from this time to this time, and this is how much they're going to pay you. And oh, it's different than the first one. It's going to just go straight to DVD. Right. That was a thing then. Sure. You know, DVD. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, oh, that doesn't sound super cool. Um, <laughs> what's the uh, what's the budget of the whole thing? And it was a fraction of what the first thing was. And I was like, right. oh, I don't, uh, I don't really, uh, I don't think this is a good idea. Yeah. And I, you know, I didn't have like this body of work where it was like beneath me to do that role at all. Right. I just didn't want to look like an asshole. Also, you were number one on the call sheet. I'm guessing you were you were the lead feller in that. You played Jeff. I was number one, and I yeah, yeah. I didn't want that to be a thing where like oh the guy from and it was this like train wreck of yeah. a film. Yeah. Anyway, uh, my rent at the time was like six hundred dollars, mm -hmm. and so I told them um, hey this sucks and it's gonna hurt me more and it's gonna hurt you but like let's pass on this and so we did and then they came back and they said hey we got a little more money in the budget put in so we can offer you more money mm -hmm. which if i told you how much it was you would laugh it was like not that much money yeah but when they said that i instantly was like oh, okay uh let's do this sure pay my rent for sure. two years sure at the time incredible at the time it was an offer that you could not uh, could not refuse, could not refuse. It, it you would have been it would have been bad financial uh it, it didn't fi make financial sense my, they made it financial so i went over there to shoot it and it was funny because i think i expected still this kind of like grand film since we're shooting in slovakia and not much happens there and I was a little underwhelmed. There were scenes where like a horde of, you know, barbarians or bad people are coming to attack a village and we got there that day and I like got on my horse and put on my helmet and I was like, all right, let's do this. And they're like, all right, like you're the barbarians. And like four guys came running over a hill yeah. with little swords. Yeah. And I was like, where are the barbarians? And they're like, oh, that's like all the extras we could get. So there's stuff like that throughout the film. Mm. War scenes are like everyone in this room, six people together yeah. fighting. And it's the same guy that you film in the, you know, the black hat and yeah. the white hat and things like that. <laughs> but as an experience, it was cool. I was 18. I got yeah. to go to Slovakia and meet those people. Yeah. Got to cruise around on the weekends. You know, those, uh, those Eastern European women. 
they all look like Mila Jovovich. Yep. Even the girls that work like at McDonald's, who yep. are also named Mila commonly, look like Mila Jovovich. It's crazy. It's one of the strangest phenomenons I've ever experienced. I shot in Romania. And I arrive there, and the, the driver who picks me up at the airport is taking me to the hotel. He's like, eh, first time in Romania? It's like, yeah, he goes, have you seen the women? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what that means. And then I realize every Romanian woman is a supermodel. Yeah. I don't know, and yet the men, troglodytes. So I don't know what happens. I think Romanian men are very handsome, <laughs> as are Slovakian men. There are some of my favorite men to look at. Yeah. But I will agree with you, the women are gorgeous. I don't I don't know what that And you know, I gotta be honest there. though. Please. To me, it's more important that they're all very smart and kind. Uh, of course that is the most I don't important. necessarily see people as ones to tens on the look you know, scale. You know, Chris, I see what you're doing here, and I want you to know I applaud it. Thank it was uh, that was foolish of me to only comment on the attractiveness of the women of Eastern Europe. What kind of shaming I'm is I'm sure this? some of them, if they put their heart and soul into it, could someday be First Lady of the United States. No, that's impossible. Now, I want to get back to your career. <clears throat> we got that, we did that. Oh! So you were in a little film called Scary Movie 2. I was. Oh boy, do I love that movie. It's a great movie. Oh, that is a great movie. Do you know, oh, I saw that movie probably five times in theaters. Can I tell you why? why? Because the trailer for Not Another Teen Movie, which is the first feature I was in, yeah. played before Scary Movie 2. And you wanted to see the trailer five times because... I took different people to see it. I was, how old was I? This was 2001, right? Yeah, uh, 2001. Sure, yeah. So I was 19, and, eight, and yeah, 19 years old. Why wouldn't a... We why, were 19. We were 19. Why wouldn't a 19-year-old want to take different friends to go see the trailer for the movie? I don't know. Yeah. Of course you do. That's amazing. So you saw Cutthroat Island and Hackers on the same day. Yep. And you saw Scary Movie 2 five, At least five, five times. times. Yeah. That's incredible. In, in theaters. Yeah. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. You got much. box office share on that, right? Yeah, the majority of it. Really? Yeah, it that was. Is I think the share was divvied up. It was like me and then all of the Waynes's. Right. And then New Line or Miramax or. Right. Anna Faris got nothing. Yeah. Uh, no. No. They, they gave her mentioned. a free hot lunch. That was it. She got to be in the movie. You know you what? Know, it's worked out so, well for her. Sometimes the work uh, speaks for itself. Agreed. Um, As Kevin would say, she's married to Sky Lord. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> um, now, when. The problem I have being having been in Not Another Teen Movie and it being a spoof film, a parody film, uh, oftentimes when people recognize me from that, they will not remember what film it was. They just know it was one of those spoof movies. So I, I, I get, I liked you in Scary Movie a lot. Right. That was my question. And I just say thank you. Right. To specify you don't have to what say number it was. It was I think, yeah, I think there ended up being... 23 of them? Is that the official? I think there's like six. There's like yeah. six? There's, yeah. There's more than we need. And I want to say it was one, two, and three that were the Waynes brothers. I believe that's correct. And then someone else took it over after that. Um, there's five. Five Waynes brothers? No, five. Five three. total. <laughs> yeah. No, there's I like think there's five Waynes yeah, brothers. Yeah, there's, there's 150 Waynes brothers, <laughs> and I can't, I've lost track of the sisters. And there's there's a younger Wayne's generation. There's that's you know, true. Who's still starring in tons of stuff. Damon Wayne's Jr. Dynasty. Yeah. They uh, they should all star in a film version of Dynasty. How cool would that be? Let's make it so. Get me Jeff Bezos on the line. Still not taking my calls. That movie was cool because the way that they would shoot was they would just kind of shoot whatever they felt like it at the moment. It wasn't necessarily indicative of the call sheet. Yeah. So they would just kind of be like, uh, yeah, I don't, no, let's not do this one. Let's do the one um, where, the, where the monkey f goes through the window. So after like week one, they just had all the actors on set yeah. all the time. Yeah. So we would just basically for three months or however long to it took to shoot that, we would just sit there playing blackjack and poker and reading magazines for like <laughs> months and months and months. It was the greatest job ever. Yeah, that sounds like a pretty good job. I also sort of worked with Marlon Brando in that movie. Oh. And this is such a cool story because in the beginning of the movie, it's uh, Dennis, 
uh, who played the priest? Uh, James Woods. James Woods. And, and um, Aunt, Andy Richter. Yes, the priest, yeah. but the James Woods character right. before he played that role right, was supposed was to be offered to Marlon Brando. And accepted. And he said, yeah, I'll take it. And I remember on set they were like, uh, Marlon Brando's gonna be in the movie. And everyone was just like in shock. Yeah. Um, Cause he's done a couple cool movies before that. One or two. He was sort of on a, a hot streak. Yeah. If you yeah. will. And he came and he basically said, here's my understanding of the situation. He said, all right, I'll do the movie. You're shooting my scene over two days. I want you to pay me like a million dollars a day. Yeah. And you have to pay me at the end of each day. And they were like, uh, okay. He came and he filmed one day. Yep. Left with his million dollars. Yep. And then he was in the hospital after that. Yep. Pneumonia. The doctors said it was pneumonia. He seemed fine the day when he left. Yeah. He was in good spirits. Yeah. And so I think it might have been the most genius money grab <laughs> of all time, where he looked at you know Dimension, Miramax, or whatever. It was like, oh, those guys can kind of do whatever they want. Yeah, I'll be in your movie. I'm going to steal a million dollars from you, mm -hmm. and I'm going to do it legally. You don't even seem in the least bit impressed no. by this move. Uh, well, he's got a history. He's done the same thing. Well, he I believe he appeared in uh, Superman the movie for one million dollars and i believe he worked one day sure or maybe two days and this was but he was in the movie yeah but that's 1978 million dollars right uh and Which yes he is, is about a hundred million dollars yeah in 2001 standards sure. adjusted for inflation i'm not good with numbers but it seems like you might be lowballing it it's probably worth a billion dollars <laughs> right um, but uh, yeah, no, that was th that was his move. He was like, you want me? "I'll do your cameo for your movie, a million dollars," which is cool. That was my Marlon Brando. Had he done? I mean, because I feel like a scary movie type movie was not the sort of thing you would see Marlon Brando commonly appearing in. No, but towards the end of his days, I feel like he he wasn't. You remember the Island of Doctor Moreau? Yeah, yeah. His decision making wasn't. So, which is not to impugn the movie. Is that the movie with the little guy? It is. It was a remake, yeah. I heard that he kind of kidnapped that little guy. Oh, I don't know about that. Someone told me that um, one day when they were done shooting, he had the little guy on his shoulders, and at the end of the day, he goes, the little guy comes home with me, and just left with him. And that small man was like, with Marlon Brando in his suite or whatever for the next like month or however long it was. And it was Marlon Brando, so they couldn't say shit. We've got to get to the bottom of this story. We got to do more stuff like Marlon Brando. I, There's well, not a lot of people telling stories about the stuff that we do. Not yet. After today, perhaps. After Made for Each Other 2. Electric. Next question? Juggalo. Um, so uh, 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 there are two of my favorite comedic actors uh, and comedians, period, in Scary Movie 2, uh, Mr. David Cross and Mr. Chris Elliott. Great. And uh, I'm wondering if you, if you had any fun experiences with either of them that you might be willing to share. Um, I had more fun experiences with David Cross mm -hmm. just because we were, f we were like in the same group of, you know, characters who went to the place. Uh, Chris's stuff was more, right. he kind of had his own thing going on. Yeah. He was really funny. I just remember when we were shooting that scene, you know, where he has the small hand mm -hmm. and he's serving everybody food right. and he's sticking his hand in the gravy and the whole night. And like most of that was just him off the cuff. Mm -hmm. He was really genius, really funny dude, but I didn't get to know him personally that well. Yeah. David Cross, now don't think I have any amazing stories that I can recount because I don't really remember As them. I've learned. But he, uh, he was a big fan of uh, playing blackjack and I was sure. a big fan of dealing blackjack at the time. So we got a to do a lot heaven. of card changing. And I just remember he was one of the only people who was not stoked with the concept of being paid to just hang out. <laughs> he wanted to be like making other stuff and right. off writing and doing stuff. So he right. was like kind of going out of his mind yeah. that we were just like eating craft service and chilling sure. for three months. Well, he was probably, and I don't want to get too technical, but probably along a schedule F type performer on the movie. So he's going to make the same amount of money whether they use him one day or a hundred. Maybe. 
So I didn't it's read understandable his deal. that uh, he, he was bothered that they called him to set when they didn't really need him. Yeah. yeah. I feel like everyone made like a, a fairly healthy sum. I feel like that on every movie though. Like when I hear anyone complain about how much they make, when you compare it to like the jobs that most people have. Oh, sure. And what we're actually doing, people be like, I'm so exhausted. I like, I've been shooting for 12 hours. Right. And you're like, that guy's a Mexican sewer diver. You know? <laughs> this is what we, am I pointing the wrong? It's a callback. It might be that way. This is a callback, ladies and gentlemen. But like, you know, people are shoveling coal and, and, and there's people like, you know, stamping license plates in prison. We're fine. Yeah. Oh no, I'm not saying he was right to complain. I'm just saying, and that wasn't a dig on David Cross. No. I'm just saying in general. No, of course. But uh, the way, and you are correct, if you if you look at the insane sums that some actors make. Yes. Compared I to. I do. Compared to what, say, someone who has to saw apart a couch in the Mexican sewers. Wow. Makes. Nice. Uh, then, of course, it's going to be insane. So the only realistic way to ever look at it is what the actor is paid versus what the... Uh, studio will ultimately make on the movie when it is successful. Again, you're still making a sum of money yes. that a lot of people would dream to just make once in their oh, life. Oh, certainly. And you're not really doing, you know, it, it, it's not to um, discount the actual work that goes into it. Being an actor is pretty exhausting and you're juggling a lot of stuff in your head and yep. you're holding that character there for months and months and months. But when you compare it to a lot of what people are doing on earth, yep. Uh, and I'm not even talking about, you know, people who live in Aleppo. I'm just saying like someone who has a normal job and has to punch the clock all day right. and go like, to a factory. Like an Alaskan fisherman. We're doing all right. Like a, like an Alaskan fisherman. Although or I think I, those guys make a lot of money they too. They do. Or an ice road trucker. Yeah, that was going to be my next They reference. also make a good deal of it. Obviously. Or like a plastic surgeon. No. Maybe I don't understand yeah. how the real world works. Uh, yeah, I feel like we're d telling different analogies yeah, here. Yeah, I've been sheltered too much. Anyway, we're doing fine, I think, is the thing to keep in mind. But on that movie, we yeah. were basically just doing fine, just doing nothing. We worked a bunch, but there were just a lot of days because of the way they shot where we would just sort of hang out. Yeah. Which is awesome. That is pretty awesome. Yeah. I would have enjoyed that. Yeah. You know, if I were a young man, I didn't have much else going on. It's always nice to be paid to hang out with people you like. Oh, it's the best. Yeah. Tom Hanks, we, we had him on the on the chat show, and the way he put it is it's when you're... Tr I mean, the way Tom Hanks sees movies is different the way I do. He says when you're trying to figure out what you want to do is your next movie, you got to take into account what the hang is going to be like. It's all about the hang. Yeah. And so, you know... It's very I, dude of him. It's very dude of him to think about the the different kinds of uh, 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 personalities that will be on, on any given set, because, you know, you're there for months at a time sometimes. You also think about how many days you have in this body on this earth. Mm. And then you look at, like, all right, if I shoot something, it's going to take a month or three months, and if I get to do 50 of those or 100 of those, that's, like, a substantial portion of your whole life. Yeah. And you obviously, like, time is probably the most valuable commodity mm -hmm. the hang is very very important very important i i never discount that and i usually get to work with cool people but every so often you shoot something and there's a total asshole on it yeah and you basically like you almost want to give the money back and not work on that project as fun as it is you're because you're spending like you know three months in a situation that just isn't fun just tell me right now are you talking about made for each other no i'm talking about this interview <laughs> I thought we were not paying the guests anymore. Commercial break? Um, no, you're absolutely right. Uh, of course. And, 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 that's, uh, and then I, I apologize for, for, for dragging you all the way across Los Angeles. But, uh, but I do want to ask you, I left this towards the end of the interview because uh, uh, we can talk about it, we cannot talk about it. A little film called American History X. Heard of it. Heard of it. More than heard of it. You were seen in it. it. That was in it. it. You're in the picture. I've Do you seen remember it that? Five times. Um, I, I was in American History X as it turned out in the end for as long as it took me to tell you that. That is that is true. It, kind of a funny story, though. I like funny stories. It would stories. seem as if we had done pre-interviews for all these stories, but we actually haven't. Nope. You, this is just, just You guys have a crack team here. Stone Cold Research by Jason McIntyre and Siri.
Um, I auditioned for a role in that movie, which was one of Eddie Furlong's, Furlong's punk friends. Yeah. I think it's him and two guys. Yeah. And, um, and then my agent called and said, you got it. And I was like, oh my God, this is great. And I went to the table read and I was sitting next to Ethan Suplee, who was mm -hmm. also in the movie. Sure. And the table read starts, all the cast assembles and we're sitting there and like, oh, I'm so stoked. This movie's like, it. the script is so good. And, and we're going in and everyone's saying their lines and stuff. And my first line comes up like 15 minutes in and I open my mouth to say the line and like someone down there says my line. And I was like, what? is what is that guy just said my line he's like what and i was like look that's my line and it, that fucking kid down there keeps saying my shit what's going on he's like i have no idea and i like sneak out and i go and i get a producer in the corner i'm like this fucking guy over there is saying all of my dialogue and she just looks at me kind of like you're looking right now like she's like i'm so sorry we forgot to tell you you didn't get that role but the good news is you did get a role. It's blah, blah, blah. Right. And I'm like, oh, okay. That's really weird. Okay, well, I'll, I'll go do the reading. And I go and sit down. I'm like, oh, let me find my line. Flipping page, flipping page. Mm -hmm. Like 45 minutes of me flipping pages go by. I finally find this guy. And it's this like one scene where I think I'm in a bathroom and I'm getting bullied, bullied yep. by black kids. And the movie was all about race. I'm white, so the black kids are beating me up, and then he's about to be a skinhead, or maybe right. is already Eddie Furlong, so he sticks up for me. Right, and then he tells you, you gotta, you gotta stand up for yourself, That's man. what he says. Yeah. He says, come on, man. I've seen the film. Have some pride in your race. So we go there to shoot. The director was Tony Kay. Yep. And he crushed it on that movie, oh, but there did. was a lot of uh, behind the scenes drama, That's what apparently, I that I didn't really notice a ton of it. Okay. But the way he would shoot was he would also operate, so he had the camera, and he would go in a room and just turn on the lights, and that was the lighting. Didn't bring any of this uh, yeah. highfalutin stuff. Well, he in. was shooting in black and white, right? For some of it. Yeah. The prison was, scenes were black except and Except for the girl in the red all coat. The, all the flat. Well, uh, besides I, that, it was all Schindler's black Schindler's List white. reference for those watching at home. Two more Schindler's re List references coming up. Okay. Not in this podcast, but... Just in general. Today. Okay. At some point. I look forward to them. So, makeup, you know, you could show up and have a zit on your face. Don't cover it. Didn't want makeup on everyone. Yeah. Like, it just wanted to look very gritty and raw, yeah. which is cool. And we went in to shoot, and Eddie Furlong is five... Oh, five, 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 four, or something. He's uh, he's a little taller than me, so let's say five, yeah, five, 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 maybe five, six. So the guys that they cast to be like the bullies, yeah, were all his height or slightly smaller, right? And they all came up to like my collarbones, right? Or you're 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 a lanky fella. I'm six nine. A lot of people would not know that. Ish. It's true. They shot on all of Malcolm. You worked in a ditch. Yes. That they cut out special for it, you. It was the same one they put Dolph Lundgren in. Yep. In uh, in the Rambo movie. And the same one the they Rocky put movie. Martin Short in in Clifford. Wow, I didn't know about that. Eh, it doesn't matter. So we go there. I'm standing in my ditch. No, we go into the bathroom. And we start to do the scene, and the, and the kids are like shoving me around, but they're like right. just like looking up at me and shoving yeah. me. And he's yeah. like, "This isn't gonna work. This is really weird. Can you do the whole scene from the ground?" Yep. And I was like, "Ah." And he's like, "What if you fall on the ground?" So the way it, it comes out in the end is, picture this: empty bathroom, mm -hmm. door flies open. I come in horizontal into the scene is my entrance. Yeah. I fly through the air, land on my back, slide over by some urinals, and then the entire scene takes place with me just like laying on the ground watching people talk over me. Yeah. I think I had four lines. So it was, you know, it was a Brando role for me. It really was. In and out, In and out a million dollars. You took your million dollars and you said Simple. thank you very much. D ha uh, did you ever see uh, a cut of the film other than the theatrical release? No, because I heard that there was the Tony K cut, right. and then they kind of took it from him, right. and they made their cut, right. and he was really butthurt about he that. Wanted, he wanted them that to change his thing. name to Humpty Dumpty. Uh, yeah. As directed by. Been there. He was, that's, that's how it's... Dragon 2 reference. Ah! Uh, 
But the way it came out was amazing. I, I don't know. I would love to see his cut. It's my understanding that there were uh, some, some other slightly different sequences, but, and I may be wrong about this, but from what I've read, it seems like it is, there's no ambiguity about the end of the film and after, oh boy, major spoiler alert for American History X wow. if you have not seen it. After uh, Eddie Furlong dies, then Derek, uh, Edward Norton, you know, shaves his, his name. Uh, Derek Vineyard. It's amazing. Uh, he shaves his head and goes back to being a skinhead. Oh. I haven't seen the movie. The, so the death of his Eddie brother Furlong dies? In, in that very same bathroom, my friend. Oh. How could you not know? Oh. I don't believe you. And spoiler alert finished. Um, well, that's... Uh, yeah, man, that was a that was a hell of a, a movie. I remember seeing that one in theaters. I Speaking think I, of a hell of a movie, you're pretty much the star of a movie that I just got to do. I was going to mention it. Last mention on the list. it right now because it's really cool. I'd like to be alone now. That's no, the, but mention the movie. I'd like to be alone. Oh, this is the new Who's I'll on First. Leave. Um, yes, you and I got to work together once more. Uh, not terribly long ago, this past, uh, last summer, we shot uh, a feature here in La La Land. Oh, God. Wow. As the words were La leaving La my body. It was like watching an accident in slow motion. I wanted to throw up. I saw this, and I was like, there's no way he's throwing out La La Land yeah. right now. Oh, I feel ill. I have to lay down now. Uh, we shot it right here in the greater Los Angeles area, which is always nice to shoot in your the own valley. backyard, right? Mm -hmm. The deep valley. No oh, it's less. great. Yeah. When I was a kid and I saw an audition come in and it was like Lithuania, mm -hmm. like, this is going to be the coolest thing ever. Now I see anything further, further away than like Santa Monica or something yeah. and I'm like, ugh. Yeah. I got to leave. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to Manhattan Beach every day. Not happening. Not happening. David Kelly, no thank you. Knew you'd go there. Um, he's the only gunny who shoots in, in Manhattan <laughs> Beach anymore. I don't know anyone else. Um, but yeah, so wait, did I get you involved in that movie or? I'm pretty sure you, I'm, I don't know, okay, but I, I don't feel either. like you said, hey, I'm doing a movie. Right. And there's a role for you or something. Yeah. Like, look out. Yeah, read, read the script. Yeah. I think they're going to contact you. So I don't know what that meant, but oh, okay. did you? Because maybe you did. I, I think I might have. I think they had, because they were having trouble casting, and they asked me if I might have known anyone, and I said... I really appreciate it. You know who's always good is... And then he wasn't available. ...is uh, Jordan Masterson, but he is working, working. on something. Yeah. So... After a few more of those you got to me. We went down. Marlon Brando, turns out he's dead. Yeah. As is the little guy. As is the little guy. And uh, I'm glad it eventually came to me. As a way of saying thank you, mm -hmm. I drove to Santa Monica today. Boy, you really to did. on your chat show. You really did. And just, I mean, I don't want to tell everybody at home where you live, but it might live as in well Silver be Lake. Arizona. Silver Lake, Arizona. Uh -huh. It might as well be Arizona for the for how long it took you to get from there to here. I got your email like, oh yeah, like uh, it's great. We're gonna do it on Sunday. And I yeah. looked at the address and I was like, what? Well, I didn't tell you where. I texted you to see if you'd do the show, and you said yes. But it you happened to leave out. I did leave out that it was Santa Monica. I got you to agree, and then I sent you the email with all the information. Yeah. Because smart. Uh, Three hundred episodes in, <laughs> I know how to uh, bury a lead. You're a solid businessman. Um, no, but that movie's really cool because the, the I don't know how much you're supposed to say about it, but the general concept is it starts at. What do you call right after a funeral where the you go wake. to the house? It, it starts at, at the wake, and this character, who's your character, right. has just lost his wife and two children. Yeah. But we don't see any of that. It just starts with everyone showing up for the wake, right. and the movie is just everything that happens in between in a situation mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. You know what I mean? No, and it takes... Which the is home. so cool. It's oh, like it's, it was a, a play. Great script. All the action takes place in the house over the initial first few hours and days and then several weeks after the after the funeral and what's cool about it is it's broken up into chapters kind yeah. of like Hannah and her sisters yep and each chapter is you know between 10 and 20 minutes or pages right and each chapter is one take that is correct on one camera yeah. so it was really a lot like doing theater again oh it yeah was just like you know, rehearse all day to do this one thing, do right. it 10 times, hope to get one perfect. Yep. 
And when we would, it was the most joyous feeling ever. Yeah. And when we wouldn't, it was like someone was tightening a noose around your neck. Yeah. And there were a few times where we were like five minutes from the end of a take and somebody would like sneeze. Yeah. And instead of going on, they'd be like, oh, cut, uh, uh, and everybody would be like, oh! <laughs> so fun to work like that, though. It was fun. It's a, uh, There's a handful of directors who like to work like that. And, and the, the writer director- John Dabak. John Dabak. Uh, on this movie, uh, I, I thought he, he did a great job. Unfortunately, people can't see that one as easily as they can see Made for Each Other because it is still in the festival stage. Uh, but I think it's just going into that. Yeah, but yeah. hopefully, yeah, they ju he just finished cutting it not long ago. I think that'll, got, that'll get bought. I think that's a really cool, interesting movie. Absolutely. I, I feel the same way. And uh, A lot of great actors. Another, another great cast. Uh, uh, Jack Long Dean, cast. Sterling. Vanessa Lenges. Vanessa Lenges. Uh, uh, Who, I'll tell you an interesting story. She texted me, I want to say a week or two ago. Yeah. And she said, um, you were in this dream that I had. It was really weird. We were at Shabbat dinner. Yep. Because we just we recently just went that. to Shabbat dinner at yep. the director John's house. Yep. And you were like in my head and we were talking, but we could only hear the conversation in my head or something like that. And I thought, oh, it's okay. I normally hate hearing about people's dreams because they're so boring, but right. that was sort of interesting. That is. Then I talked to her this morning. Oh my. She said, oh my God, this is really crazy. I just called off my marriage with my fiance, who we met that night. I remember a really him. cool guy. He's an underwater welder. Is he really? Yep. Which is not that far away from being a Mexican, Mexican. sewer diver. There it is. That's amazing. Because she said that she decided the way that she wants to have relationships and live life or something like that yeah. is just different than how he does. Yeah. And for them to be married and be together forever wasn't going to work for her. Yeah. And what she didn't tell me in the first text was in that dream, what I was saying in her head was like, what are you doing? You can't be happy like yeah. this. Yeah. You, this is not how your life's supposed to go, which I wasn't. I was just sitting there eating the, you know, the bread that looks like a pretzel. Uh-huh. You know? Uh, challah? Yeah, challah. Sure. I was eating the challah. Um, anyway, this dream, like, gave her some sort of... Uh, epiphany. Epiphany or crisis. Sure. I, I don't, I wasn't there. Yeah. And just, like, within the last day or two, I think... They called it off. Wow. She's up in Montreal, wow. hanging out with her family. Wow. And it's because of a dream that I technically have no responsibility in, but I feel bad about. Wow. There are two things that I've, I've learned here. The first is that... Um, I don't know how to say chala. You don't know how to say chala, so three things. The second is, I hope Vanessa is all right with us discussing her personal life. You know, it's funny that you ask. Yeah. I asked her. You're a good man. Yeah. I wouldn't just throw someone under the bus like that. Much Is that why you've been staring at me? Kind of like, no. A deer in the headlights? No, no, no. Because then the third thing is. I was like, I'm going to see Sam today. We're doing a chat show. I have to tell him this story. And she's like, totally. And I was like, oh, you don't oh. mind? She's like, nah, I don't care. I was going to say, we both know her. She's a very free spirit and then she would not care. But mostly, the most important takeaway from this, you're kind of like Freddy Krueger. I'm not not like Freddy Krueger, if that's what you were saying. I agree. And now I'm terrified to go mm, to sleep tonight. As am I. For what may happen between us and my dreams. As am I. Because if you think about it, if you die in your dream, yeah. you die in real life. That's, that's what... That's, in if this world, science right? has taught us anything, yes. it's that. If you are kind of like Freddy Krueger, but you kill yourself in your dream, do you die in real life? Oh. Let me get my father back on the line. He can answer that one. Um, can you believe it's been over 90 minutes? I can't. I feel like we should talk about some of the other cast members in that great movie to not leave anyone out. I mean, who who are we missing? I don't uh, remember who you said. Now, you have you to Spencer understand. Grammer. We did say Spencer yeah. Grammer. Uh, 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 Carl uh, McDowell is in the, the mm -hmm. film. Uh, who else? Uh, David. Uh, Duchovny. Dave, not David Duchovny. Uh, oh, man. Brent. Dave, Dave, David, Brent? David Brent? I think that's uh, from The Office. David Brent. Go on. I think that's, uh, that's the character from The Office. Mm -hmm. That's not important. David, I'm so sorry, we're blanking on your last name, but he's British and he's lovely. Oh, 
David Finn. Finn, yeah. Nailed it. Fantastic. The best. Kind of the star of the movie, I feel yeah, like we definitely should have remembered pretty him. much number one. Yeah. Uh, my character, I spent most of the movie hidden in a room, so. You really Sam Levine'd it. Oh, because big time. Your character, if you think about it, is the star of the movie. It's about this guy, this thing happens to him, and then his family's there. Yeah. But you bored yourself off in a room, yep. and you got to like not work a whole lot. The bulk of the shoot, you just got to chill, eating craft service. That's true. And playing blackjack yep. with David Cross. That's exactly. Which is a bitchin' job. It is the best job. And I don't regret it for a single minute. Um, but I, I, I do regret that we are just about out of time. Speaking of regrets. Yeah. I wish we had more time. It's so great to see you. This was so wonderful, and then you know I can't let you go without the Larry King game. Go on. Which we discussed before the show. Uh -huh. So I will happily remind you that you have to play the Larry King game to get out of here. So that involves a bad Larry Let's King Let's talk about the impression. rules. Bad Larry bad King Larry impression. King. That's all you're going to get. OK. Then as Larry, you're going to give us that TMI moment before he throws to the phones in an interview. OK. So it can be any aside, anything about Larry, his sexual proclivities, his, uh, the fact that he's a million years old, his first ride right. on a dinosaur, uh, whatever you want. Tell me if this works. Well, hang on. Whatever it is, it More works. rules? It works. I guarantee you it works. Whatever you're thinking. If I stood up and just left right now, that would work for you? That wouldn't. You have to do it within the frame of the camera. So I guess technically that is a rule. I don't know what just happened there. That was telekinesis. Did I just make the camera move? You, you have the force. Yes, you killed his camera somehow. Is that true? Yes. Wow. That's incredible. Oh, what no Larry King impression. It's great. That is one of the most. In no. the 300 episodes, yeah, the 300 has something episodes. like that ever occurred? Did I just Matilda that shit? <laughs> He's back. He's We're back. back? We're back. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna point my finger guns at anyone else the rest of my life. Uh, oh my god, it's like that movie Real Men. No one's seen that movie. Real you, Men? Real Men? Drawing a blank over there. Really no one's uh, seen that movie. One. I think you You've made that up. You've seen that movie? Do you mean Real Genius? Yeah, I know no. Real Genius. Yeah, I, I don't know. With the thin version? With Jim Belushi and John Ritter. Yeah. Real oh. Men? Where they're like, where, where you get the choice between the gun, the big gun, or the a something. A glass of water. A glass of water. Yeah. And they give him the baseball, and he sticks the thing, and it flies yeah. away. And then at one point, it's Belushi, like a CIA agent. Yes, every day she tells Ritter this will work. Just put that and, down. Sorry. first of all, and he does yeah. it, and it works. That was a solid reference. Wow, that, that was only a solid six reference. people appreciated. That was like well, that's okay. Referencing that was for the fans at home. Can you be good? The biker movie. Okay, I'm sorry, you're not off the hook. Okay, bad Larry King. Bad Larry King. TMI information. TMI. TMI. TMI moment. Yeah. And then you throw to the phones. Throw to the phones. And the phones ha starts with a city name. And if the city name happens to be funny, it's not going to hurt you. It's that's probably not going to be funny. That's fine. Uh, when you're ready. Would he say oi? Sure. He'll, He'll say anything. Oi. Uh, I just shouted Tiffany from Muskegee, New York <laughs> to you. That's it. Yeah? That's how you play. There's no wrong way to play. Can I drive back to yes. Silver Lake now? Yes, you can go back to Silver Lake now. <laughs> thank you. Uh, but first, uh, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart, Chris. Go for it. This was a, this was a true yeah. treat for me. Uh, thank you so much for your time, your stories, your energy. I could just sit at a table and look into your eyes all day, and eventually I'm going to bite your face like a fucking monkey. Wow. Because it's just a very biteable face. It just got so weird. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you. I love you. No, no don't. I got to go. No, nope, not second. leaving. Not Wait going one anywhere. Second. Wait one second. That's it. Uh, this was our 300th episode, um, but... Uh, I, I can't believe it's it's been this long, and I'm uh, from the bottom of my heart to you at home. Thank you for sticking it out with us all, all this time. I of course this show would never happen without our incredible, wonderful crew. Uh, all of them I want to thank right now, uh, starting with uh, Jamie Fox. Thanks for uh, thanks for being you, Jamal. Uh, you're the best. Uh, who else do we have in the room today? I think we have Brian McCauley in the room today. Uh, Dr. Kenny Chen. Uh, Jaden Fox on makeup today. Thanks for making us look good. Uh, Mike Duman. Jason McIntyre up in the crow's nest. Uh, Luke Allen. Post. What's that? Oh, Luke Allen, of Luke course. Luke Allen, of course. Corey Levin on post. Yes. And uh, just for the heck of it, uh, I would like to thank my parents for always watching the show and letting me know that the audio was either good or not good <laughs> during the show. <laughs> thank you so very much, folks. Uh, so for me, until next time, fuck off. <laughs>